Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. very compelling evidence that we uh, we may not be alone, whatever that means. Characteristics appear to demonstrate advanced technology. Arrow is the culmination of decades of DOD intelligence community and congressionally directed efforts to successfully resolve UAP encountered first and foremost by U.S. military. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Disclosure Team with me, your host, Vinny Adams. The following is an interview with Beatriz Villaroel. Beatrice is Assistant Professor at the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics. She is also on the advisory board for the Sol Foundation. If you enjoy this content, please just take a second, hit that like button, subscribe and turn on that notification bell so you know when I put out new videos. Comment down below and share it with your friends. I really appreciate all of the support. I hope you enjoy this interview with Beatrice Villaroel. So Beatrice, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? Very well, <laughs> thank you. How are you doing? Yes, not bad at all. I'm great. Um, just happy to be speaking with you. Uh, and I'd love to kick off this interview um, by just sort of getting a bit of a background about you sort of growing up, what your life was like, and sort of where your early interests developed that kind of led you to do the work that you do today. Oh, it's, it's my life has been quite like, or my career has been very like <laughs> confusing. Okay uh like when i was a kid i really liked astronomy like all kids i think they are naturally curious and they look up the sky and they just wonder and the same was for me but i also liked music i like playing music i liked writing and i like painting i liked a lot of stuff so it wasn't until quite late actually already at university that i decided to become an astronomer even i started my university studies in um an engineering program in molecular biotech. So it wasn't right. uh, like a sure decision to become an astronomer. It's later just that curiosity really led me there. And you know, I'm one of these people that once I ne need to solve a problem, then I go and try to solve it. And I can't really give in until my curiosity has been stilled. So that's kind of how I ended up here. That's brilliant. I love that. Yeah, that, that tenacity to keep going until a problem is resolved. I, I appreciate that. And so what was your sort of studying part of your life like through, is it college, university? What was your progression like to get to, you know, the qualifications that you have? Well, it was this, as I mentioned, I was first at this um, um, engineering program in molecular biotechnology. And uh, I remember like, uh, hearing the same information over and over at this program, it was really boring and I couldn't help <laughs> it because there were 
they were going through the same material at every course and it felt like a repetition or I, I think I should have probably either studied a pure uh, molecular biology program or something, but not this uh, bioengineering thing. So at the fourth year, I started taking more physics courses and more physics courses and astronomy courses, and then whoop, I became an astronomer instead. So that's, that's a little bit how it was. That's fantastic. And at any point during your kind of childhood or you know earlier years, did you have any kind of interest in the UFO subject, even on any level? Well, uh, as a as a kid, when I was maybe three or four years old. Uh, so when my parents weren't at home, please don't tell them. My brother was showing me Star Wars movies and Terminator and this kind of thing. So of course I loved everything that had to do with uh, the space. And I was wondering are the Jedi's. I, I still have a childhood trauma when I thought that I was going to watch a Star Wars movie, but it turned out to be a Star Trek movie. Ooh. It's, yeah, it's, I still remember that feeling. And, um, so I, I, I was very excited into that. And as a teenager, I was watching X-Files and I loved it. And uh, it's, I never expected my career path to take me where I am now, but it's just purely by curiosity. So yeah. one step at a time. Absolutely, indeed. Now, you obviously, you, um, you've also become recently um, on the advisory board for the Soul Foundation, which held their first inaugural conference, let's say, back in, I think, November of 2023, where you gave a wonderful presentation. So would you just mind telling us a bit more about uh, how that came about and your, just your thoughts on, on Sol and its work in general? I think they're amazing. Like Gary Nolan and Peter Scaffish are doing really brilliant work. They are really dedicated. So I'm so honored that they asked me to join um, the advisory board. And like I joined very recently, so it's very exciting, and I'm looking forward like to to, to the work we're going to do together. So the, the symposium, I'm going to say something again. It was probably the most interesting conference that I ever been to. And like uh, if I compare it to let's say a regular conference on searches for extraterrestrial intelligence SETI, then you kind of, I mean, you go to the SETI conference and you hear some interesting ideas. And a lot of zero results or no results at all. People don't even try out the ideas most of the time. So you have the zero results or lack of results. Here, people actually can show stuff on this on the Soul Foundation meeting. They can show progress they've been doing and new interesting ideas. And it's so exciting. It's, it's a completely new thing for me. It's also this mixture of people from different, like cross-disciplinary from different professions, different insights, and all really brilliant. I loved it. It was amazing, the, the conference. Excellent. Yeah, so I, I mean, I've watched. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've watched all the talks and, and the, the presentations were just of such a high level. And, you know, more and more we see a lot of academics and scientists becoming involved in or certainly talking about the UFO UAP subject uh, in, a, in a serious manner. Um, so, I mean, since you've been kind of talking about this subject, have you had any kind of pushback or negativity or ridicule along the way um probably but i already forgot <laughs> i filter it away you know yeah, that's the best way to do it absolutely of course i had some pushback and i still have it but this at the same time i had so many positive experiences i made so many wonderful friends that i connected on on a genuine level uh, in a way that uh, I, I wouldn't be able to connect with just a regular astronomy colleague. So for me, that has been a really such a beautiful experience that it has like um, made me forget the rest. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm on the same level. I've met so many wonderful people doing this and, you know, the, the small minority of negative people, shall we say, it's, yeah, they're easily forgotten. So I can relate to that comment. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I you're also in, sorry, go, sorry. At least on the topic of the European science, so that's sure. Yeah, and, and you're part of UAP Sweden as well. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that group and and what their kind of role is or or their their goals, let's say? So, so they are an amazing group in Sweden uh, that I got to know like very recently, and um, so I became a new member. So it's a, a very young group of UAP. Uh, 
in interest of people who are, many of them are experiencers and they are very kind and that's why I like them and uh, there are also many really brilliant people there so it's a like fun exchange I learned a lot because you know I don't come from ufology side I'm an astronomer so I come in simply through my science like finding weird things and what am I seeing and here I had a chance to exchange like a lot of uh, very like interesting experiences and information so uh, the way how kind of we uh, also interact is that they are leading a project uh, a crash retrieval program so uh, I've promised to help them by setting up this web page on the Vasco website where we simply assemble if someone has seen a crashed UFO please go to the to the website of the ECR initiative or directly to the Vasco web page and you can report yes it crashed in my village uh, three years ago, and there is still uh, a piece of the UFO is still lying there. Please come and take it. So, if you have seen a crashed UFO, please go to the web page and report it, and we will have a look. We might be a little bit slow because everyone do this uh, in their free time, including myself. This is a hobby thing for all of us. Yeah, yeah. So, have you had any people report anything exciting yet? Yes, but I cannot say more about that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll be sure to keep an eye out uh, for any information that, that you do release through that initiative. So I'll make sure that all of the links for anything we talk about are in the description as well. So people can go and take a look. Um, but you mentioned there Vasco and that's kind of what I really wanted to dig into. So Vasco is the vanishing and appearing sources during a century of observations project. So could you just explain a bit more about what it actually is about and any key objectives? So, uh, so it's actually a project that has been running since 2017. And this was originally like an, a, a project aimed to find like really unusual anomalies in the sky, but also SETI candidates. And we wanted to find vanishing stars. Imagine a star that is there and it has always been there and one day it just poof, vanishes. Now that is what I wanted to look for. Uh, so we, from 2017 until recently have been looking and we have been looking through one billion objects and we never found that single star that vanishes. Bad news. But we did find a lot of things that were there in the old images and never were found again. Let's say we, we can call them vanishing objects, but it's still, or I prefer to call it transient, some kind of short-lived transient event that flared up briefly in, let's say, during one exposure time, during a few minutes, and then they vanished. So these things have been really weird. And uh, we found some really exciting examples where you can see nine of them appearing and vanishing in a small image at the same time or within one exposure time, let's say within 15 minutes. Then we found more of these examples. And we were trying to like, hey, what is creating this? What is actually causing this? And uh, we, we've been wondering about everything and we have excluded a lot of explanations and uh, like all astrophysical explanations are out. And then what we are left with that it's some kind of errors on the place that we just haven't managed to pinpoint versus that we actually are seeing some object that flash up and very shortly and very briefly some astronomic or let's say some probably artificial object. The problem is that these images are from before Sputnik, before the first human satellites. So if we are seeing these things that are blinking very briefly, let's say, that behave like satellites or look like satellites in photographic plates, they're not going to be human. Now, that is what brought me to the, this UFO topic, the finding of these uh, interesting events. And it's a very fun thing to examine, and we are still working on it. We are all the time trying to solve small little puzzles along the way. Uh, we found recently, or my actually my colleague Enrique Solano found this beautiful example of three vanishing objects. They are there on the 19th of July 1952, and then they vanish again. And you never see them again. And the funny part about them is that they coincide in time with the Washington 1952 UFO. Uh even more funny is, is the Wikipedia thing about it, because some people put it, that thing inside uh, Wikipedia 
for the Washington 1952 flap. And then you see the material going in and out, in and out. It's like <laughs> transient. <laughs> so on the webpage. So wow, that's incredible. I mean, what would you say the main challenges are in detecting kind of extraterrestrial intelligence using optical sort of um, signals? Well, uh, <laughs> I would actually say funding, because in order to do a really good experiment, you're going to need more of uh, like more than one telescope. And I think that's the primary challenge is all the practicalities, because if you have unlimited resources, you can actually design amazing experiments. But once you have these limitations, the practical limitations, even when you pass some of the limitations, new limitations enter practical limitations. So I would say that is the biggest trouble because what you want to do is to have an experiment where you can really verify it. Let's say with the transients that we find in the Vasco plates, uh, there's a big challenge in that we cannot go back, back 70 years in time yet and verify the transient. So that's a challenge. But it's actually also fun with these challenges. You need then to try to invent a new solution. Yeah. Absolutely. And what can you tell me about the study of active galactic nuclei? So this is something I did a lot during my PhD times and also like um, during my postdoc. Uh, I have been working more with Vasco lately than with the AGN in the last year, I think. And uh, so I, I was working a lot with trying to understand how dif different spectral classes of active galactic nuclei or AGN, as I like to, ca like to call them, are related because some of these, if you take a look at the spectra, some of them have very broad lines and other have very narrow lines. And one tries to see, okay, are they related? Are they the same object? Are they the same class of objects? This, and how are they differing? The only way how we will be able to understand the accretion disks of AGN is if extraterrestrials come to us and explain them. So there has not been too much progress on the topic in the last 30 years. So, so I mean, how does the presence of AGN affect the habitability of, let's say, planetary systems within their host galaxies? Uh, well, let's say you're going to have a very strong radiation field there. It's right. too fun to live close to an AGN, I suspect, especially if you have some jets coming out of it, which is in 10% of all the cases. So it's not fantastic for habitability. So maybe you want to live far away from it. I mean, can the trans can the AGN, let's say the outflows of AGN, can they influence the transmission of signals or do they block them in or? Immediately, I don't see how, but I'm sure I will th think about it for a day and maybe change my opinion. But uh, I don't think that's a direct problem for it because all these outflows very often happen on very small scales next to the center. While I imagine that the life will exist in the host galaxy that at much larger scales, most of them. All right. Okay. So, so with the techniques uh, like the observational techniques in AGN, how do they differ from sort of the techniques used in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI? I think the only thing that uh, differs is the way how we have used our imagination to search for ET. I think traditionally people have been using radio telescopes, which, can, which also can be well used for AGN. It's just that they look for different things. I mean, all the observational techniques in astronomy can be applied on any question. You just need to figure out exactly what you want to ask and what you want to answer. So I'm, I'm sure there is a lot of ways how one can apply the same techniques to both questions. Mm. I mean, are there any ethical considerations associated with broadcasting signals into sort of AGN rich regions? Don't piss off the black hole. Otherwise, <laughs> I don't. So let me ask you this. I mean, we, when we talk about extraterrestrial civilizations, we're thinking about them, you know, residing in deep space. But then we think about theories of alternate dimensions and manipulating of space time. Does, does, do those kind of theories throw up any issues when when trying to look out using the techniques that you do um let me rephrase a little bit of some things that i've been thinking about lately you know I, I think many of their listeners might be familiar with the kardashian scale where you have a scaling 
uh, depending on how much energy a civilization, an advanced civilization could consume, it's going to have a higher and higher number. So uh, Kardashev civilization, not Kardashian civilization, I need to <laughs> remind myself of that. Um, so so the energy consumption has been the way how one has defined how advanced the civilization uh, can be. Let's say if you can harvest all the energy of a star or harvest lots of stars in a galaxy or et cetera, and then you're smarter and smarter. I, I wonder if it wouldn't be interesting to actually change this scale and instead of defining it by energy, uh, defining the advanced um, advancement of our civilization by the, um, the by the apparent physics it has to break or apparent physical laws that it has to find that we don't know about today. Let's say I, I think I have a re really difficult time to imagine that we are going to be able to break causality and go back in time. So maybe that would be a type four <laughs> civilization. Yeah. And uh, maybe depending on if you I mean, all this kind of uh, new imaginative or speculative physical things, how difficult they are. And I'm sure some maybe are even more crazier than others. We could actually define a new type of scale. I, I would like to see that. And maybe then we would actually conclude that uh, certain features aren't that crazily advanced as others. So I personally think that if you are going to see a UFO, it is much more likely that what we are seeing is going to be some kind of robotic AI probes that are sent all over the galaxy rather than some time travelers. Because I think that uh, just by the likelihood to even break, find a civilization that has that capacity of going back in time is going to be uh, much smaller than finding a civilization that has the capacity of uh, uh, invading your solar system with lots of probes so uh, it's something i've been thinking about about that we should redefine the scale for advanced civilizations yeah absolutely i mean I'm, i think i'm right in saying that we're like a zero on the scale as a as a species and you know if we were to i i mean if we do have let's say crash retrievals and access to this advanced technology you know and we're we're a, a type zero civilization maybe dealing with type one or even higher technology you know are we ready to even begin to understand it do you think um probably not but we still should try oh yeah yeah absolutely it always begs the question for me you know because we often hear, you know, the, the speculation that we've cracked anti-gravity back in the 50s and we have our own UFOs flying around that were man-made. But, I mean, I struggled personally to believe that. I'd love to be proven wrong. What do you think? Do you think we cracked it? I have no, uh, I haven't been presented with any data or any uh, physical evidence that would prove that to me. But once I see it, I will be open-minded. And if you have some such uh items please show them to me i will be excited to check it out mm, so i i'm absolutely. open minded that this might happen but uh, i have not seen an indication of, of it so no that's understandable that's fair enough i mean i mean you mentioned there about the ai probes and, and i always keep seeing these von neumann probes kind of cropping up in the conversation these self-replicating -re things is that the kind of thing that you were sort of yeah mentioning? I mean Imagine if you have this, uh, if you have the whole galaxy just full of uh, billions of probes that have been like produced during maybe millions of years, or maybe have even more, many more, and it could be like everywhere. They could be communicating, and if they also create a big AI system, you will have it. It will exchange information between these probes that will teach each other stuff, and. Who knows, maybe they can even interact with us on a human level without that we know it and exchange information. Who knows what technology such a probe could have in order to get information? Not necessarily that it has a telescope and watches down on the earth, maybe, you never know. I think that would be super cool, such a, such a system of AI-driven probes everywhere. Yeah, I mean, just sticking with AI as well. I mean, do you actually utilize AI in in your work in in helping you sort of with the data and this kind of research? 
we have an AI implemented into the citizen science project, the ML Blink. Uh, however, it has proven much more efficient to just use the automated searches that we did uh, with the Spanish virtual observatory. We didn't even need an AI. So we could actually do it with uh, um, more traditional methods, such for vanishing stars. Maybe in the new Exopro project, we will need an AI to find the candidate events we will see step by step. So with these sort of objects that disappear, how, how would you, you know, if you manage to capture more, which would be great, how do you even begin to work out what they are? Like what, what data analysis needs to be done to determine whether they are a star or, or an object of some sort? Well, you can always examine the shapes and the brightness profiles and compare it to stars in the field. So that's one of the ways how you can work with it. Now, when you have photographic plates, things get very difficult because of uh, you have one image usually of something. And if these events uh, are real, then they happen during 50 minutes or so. And they you're not going to have several of these plates showing the same thing. So you have to put up a, a lot of different hypotheses. And that if, if you see this, it could mean that. If you see this, it could mean that. And you do you simply test. You go through and do a lot of tests. And that's how we did for the scientific reports paper in 2021 and have been doing for uh, new, kind, new papers. For example, one of the predictions we did was that in case you see several along a line, uh, that means it could be a satellite. And then we went out and searched for it, and we estimated the statistical probabilities for several of them to fall on a line. And we found two statistically significant candidates. Like um, the best one was one in 10,000 candidates, uh, where you had five of them kind of on a symmetrical on a band or very thin band. And that candidate happened on the 27th of July in 1952 which happens to be the second weekend of the famous Washington 1952 flap. So now we have two coincidences for the, the Washington flap, just by chance. Yeah. <laughs> so what, I mean, we, everybody knows when, when people hear the word SETI, they automatically sort of relate it to the, the organization who, you know, the SETI Institute yeah. who have been around for years. So. How how does SETI look on on a, on the grander picture about the work being done? Because I think it's the SETI Institute. I think people just assume it's a an an older way of of looking into out into the cosmos. Let's say, but what is SETI and how is it sort of progressing uh, over time? Uh, so um, so uh, the, actually, that's our research community. So there are right. some people from the organization, from the SETI Institute, there are people from the Breakthrough Listen program, there are people from the Italian SETI, there are people from the Russian SETI groups, there are people from all over the world who contribute to the SETI community. And they can work on different topics. Some people will work on Dyson spheres, which are like giant solar cells around and wrapping a star and sucking out all the energy. And then there are people who work I mean, the really funded groups actually work with um, radio searches. So like at the UCLA and so on, they, they do very often radio searches. Then there are some that try to do some optical set experiments as well. So there's a broadness. Um, but I think most people, when they hear SETI, they think of the SETI Institute and the radio SETI. Yeah. Um, however, it's not a super big community. I don't know how much it could be, 50 to 100 people. Uh, there are some people who are open to UAPs, but many are very negative to UAPs. So, um, uh, which is, I think it's a pity because within SETI one talks about searching for a needle in a haystack. And I, and like, there are so many different hypotheses one can test and one doesn't know in which direction to go. And then I wonder, so here you have a clear direction. The UFO uh, direction actually provides you a direct hypothesis what to look for, like uh, alien spaceships near the Earth, and you don't even need to kind of uh, search for this needle in a haystack if it's correct with all the testimonies, uh, which I think there's very good probability given all the material that is coming in. You actually have a much easier path there. It's like a low-hanging fruit in such case. Uh, mm. 
So, yeah. well, but there's, there is a strong uh, stigma among astronomers when it comes to the UAPs and the SETI community is no exception, unfortunately. But that's better for, for us who work on the UAPs. We, we get time to explore the field before others, before other competitors are entering. Very true. Yes, I like the way of looking at that. Because, I mean, for me, it always seems uh, I, I struggle to understand that somebody who's looking for extraterrestrial intelligence, that it could actually be here on our doorstep or could have been here for many years and they're just not willing to entertain the idea. I can understand if they're, they're scientists and they're data driven, but even to just completely. No, it's, it's almost like this, like a paper is only serious as long as it gets negative results. However, if, if you have the opposite, if you need to disprove a paper that has some kind of signs of, uh, um, that has some kind of signs for uh, that ET is here, then you don't need that extraordinary result. You can have a weak statistical thing and the paper will still maybe go into review. So it's, uh, it's even difficult to get papers on the topic of UFOs into review into a journal. I mean, it's too much of uh, like human behavior that has polluted uh, the research right now. But what can we yeah. do? We just have to outweigh it, do our best, and I'm sure the winds will change. So I'm not worried. Yeah. I mean, and let's just say hypothetically going forward that things, your work progresses as you would like it to. How does your research look in five years, uh, in 10 years, like in, in an ideal world? What would that look like to you? In an ideal, wor ideal world, we have already found Alien Probe uh, with the Exoprobe project. We located it. Uh, we got support to bring it down to the earth and now it's in a laboratory and let's say you do find you know we find one of these probes and we're able to get to it how would we take it down and bring it back that that was kind of like what would we need to be able to do that so they are already today they are um, these uh, programs let's, let's say like the osiris rex where someone goes to an asteroid and picks up a sample and there are also companies that are specialized on picking up space trash so this is feasible. And my thought is simply that if we find something that looks very interesting, we should collaborate with one of these uh, space trash uh, uh, picking up companies to go there and fetch the probe. And that's my thought. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's that. I mean, that would be fantastic to, to have something tangible and physical to be able to study would certainly, you know, progress. Uh, the research so yeah, i agree that would be wonderful an intact um, that it's intact yes. not not a, not a crash probe but an intact probe it would be so different so yeah it begs the question how are that how do they maneuver what cyst propulsion system would they i mean it opens up so many questions for yeah, research I, I, imagine now you do this very expensive mission to pick it up you go there and at two meters distance, the probe just looks at you and says, okay, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. And well, there we have a new problem. <laughs> yeah, it just zips away. Wow. I mean, there's so many potentials. Right, I'm going to move on to a question that was sent to me by a guy called John Stokes on Twitter. He, he said, I believe she is currently looking at photographic plates from the Palomar Observatory. Does yes. she plan at looking at other plates from other observatories? Yes, with time, because even the stuff we're doing now takes a lot of uh, computing time. So hopefully we will manage more different observatories as well. Um, and what would the, would you be looking at the, for the same kind of objects or the same things from these different observatories to kind of cross reference the data? Is that is that what it does? Well, they, it's unlikely that they were watching the same part of the sky at the same time. Right. So it's not going to happen. but. I think Harvard has a very nice plate collection, so maybe we will, uh, once we're done with the Palomar plates, we might um, move there and have a look at what remains of it. But also there's this um, Maria Mitchell Observatory that has a plate collection that is much smaller, but that is interesting. So I think these are possibilities. The Vatican has a plate collection, Lick Observatory has a plate collection. So there are plenty of different plate collections. It's just that for every type of photographic plate you need to do quite a I mean a lot of calibrations and it's a lot of preparatory work so you don't you don't just take a plate 
uh, from a different observatory and uh, analyze it like that because you need to do to do a lot of this preparation work before. So, so far we are with the Palomar, but later we will probably switch because there's more information we can get. Right. I understand. That's great. So, I mean, obviously it's, you know, you've got a lot of different things going on at the moment. What, what, what can we sort of expect to see from you on, on all of those projects in the coming months? That's a good question. So, um, I hope that we will have some new results with the photographic plates that we're working on right now. Uh, we're addressing some uh, questions from other astronomers and we are also, I, I want to explore more the Washington 1952 potential correlation with this flap. Maybe it was a coincidence, maybe it is a correlation and I want to know if I can find out uh, which of the two alternatives is true. And of course, the, my main project is nowadays Exoprobe. And I hope we will be able to have first light with a telescope soon. It's a long process to buy a telescope, I've learned, if you do it through a university. Very slow process. <laughs> so you know, I think what, we, what we'll see is hopefully updates on how that is going with the, with the new Exoprobe. That's wonderful. Any just, plans with the Sol Foundation at all? I will talk about it at a different point. Not right. Not sure, right. Now. No problem. No, uh, I understand. No problem at all. Well, Beatrice, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, like I said earlier on, I will make sure that all the links are in the description of the video so people can go and check out all the different things that, that you're doing. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure.